Welcome to the latest World Cup date, June 18th, final match day in Group C, and it, it lived up to the billing. It, it was a little slow to get started, but the final 20, 25 minutes brought some team chaos uh, to the fore. Brazil ends up 1-0 over Italy, Australia ends up 4-1 over Jamaica, and you had three teams finish leading the group level on six points. But after all of the tiebreak scenarios, it is Italy winning the group. They will go into a round of 16 match against Nigeria or China. It's Australia second, not on goal differential because they were level with Brazil there. It's on total goals scored, and the last goal will be a talking point. They go into a round of 16 match against Norway, and Brazil finishes third in the group, and they are likely going into a round of 16 match against France, although it is still possible they go into a round of 16 match against Germany. You know, not a whole lot better. Jason Longshore, Jessica Sharman with you today, and there are so many different little things in both of these matches that that we've got to talk about. Do you want to start with Jamaica? And, And I know you were a little surprised by the goalkeeper situation for Jamaica. Yeah, surprised to an extent, disappointed more. I felt bad for Schneider. Um, Of course, they rotated goalkeepers. We spoke about it. And the other goalkeeper, um, Jason, you'll have to prompt me on her name, um, was more likely the goalkeeper that had an influence in Jamaica's qualifying for the World Cup. So I can understand the coach's decision to play her. You know, she's worked hard to qualify the team. She deserves some minutes under the belt. But I think it was a a decision that came back to haunt Jamaica. Uh, Goalkeeper made a couple of errors, but it was more than just that. Under Schneider, there seemed to be some sort of defensive organization for Jamaica. Uh, I really enjoy uh, when you can hear the goalkeeper talking from set plays and stuff like that. And on every uh, recording of the Jamaica game that I could hear, when Schneider was in goal, there was clear organization and instruction from that goalkeeper. Now, I didn't watch the Jamaica game, um, and I've only watched highlights, I can't tell. But from the performance of the defensive line, you have to wonder how much faith they had in their goalkeeper and how much organization she was offering from the back. Because all four goals, uh, Sam Kerr obviously is a monster, but all four goals are made very easily for someone of her caliber. You know, she was unmarked and then there was two real bad defensive turnovers and one goalkeeper nightmare. And it, it's just disappointing because Schneider had put in some great performances Mentally, uh, we spoke about potentially she suffered a little bit after her penalty save was overruled. She had a couple of errors towards the end in that game. And I think she would have liked to have kind of cleaned her slate and had a chance against a team where Australia haven't been looking that great this tournament. I think Jamaica would have had a better chance of defending and keeping the score down with Schneider in goal. Yeah, it's a pretty amazing story, actually, with Nicole McClure. And and Jamaica was not officially eliminated coming into the day, but they were all but eliminated. They were going to have to beat Australia by a huge margin to have a chance. So Nicole McClure gets the the start and goal. 29 years old, uh, from New York originally. Both of her parents are Jamaican. And she was instrumental in getting... Jamaica here she made her senior debut for Jamaica in 2009 but in the CONCACAF women's championship in 2018 which was also World Cup qualification the third place match was essentially a a win in your end match with Panama and McClure came on in the penalty shootout and made two saves so she almost literally brought Jamaica here She came on in that shootout kind of like Tim Krull for the Netherlands in the 2014 World Cup uh, where he Mm. came on in the shootout. I hate that. I do (laughs) too. I I can't stand it. I cannot stand it. It's only good when it works. And I don't like it. It's disrespectful to the other goalkeeper. That goalkeeper has worked an entire 120 minutes to keep them in the game. It actually happened to me once when I was little and my dad (laughs) was more angry than me, I think. But (laughs) it's just disrespectful to the goalkeeper and you look so stupid when it goes wrong I remember in a college uh, conference game another team did it and their goalie that they put in didn't make a single save and at that point you have to wonder why on earth are you taking that risk Mm -hmm. um 
And I have to wonder, I mean, yeah, she may have been good at PKs, but today her positioning was off. She looked shaky. And when you haven't got minutes under your belt in, you know, match minutes, you're not going to perform to the same level. And I think that show today, she didn't look match ready for this game. And like you say, Jamaica were pretty much out. It's nice of them to reward her for her minutes. But also, she's 29 years old. How much more does she have under her belt in terms of her international career? Should this game have been used for Jamaica as a building point for future tournaments and using someone like Schneider, who's only 19 years old and is the future of Jamaica goalkeeping? Yeah, no, completely agree. It, that's what's tricky about these situations, and, and I think there was probably a lot of emotion in the squad. Um, McClure, you know, it's 19 caps, but it's not like Jamaica's had a lot of international appearances. I mean, she's been with the program for 10 years, and she's probably not going to be back at another World Cup if Jamaica qualifies, which won't be easy in four years. So I get it. It's it's really difficult, and she struggled today, and her struggles actually ended up having a really big role in how this group finished out. Um, before we move on from Jamaica, though, they get a goal, and a it great was goal. so cool to see them get that goal, and, and a, a great one as well, and it was Bunny Shaw on the assist. Yeah, it was a fantastic ball through from Bunny, and the finish was nice too, but you have to look at Australia's uh, defense and also their midfield. The, the turnover in the middle of the field is weak. Uh, goalkeeper comes out after, look, the through ball from Bunny was incredible. It was perfectly timed, perfectly weighted past. The run was impressive, but the defenders kind of were running in water. The goalkeeper comes out into no man's land, makes a, a ridiculous slide. But for me watching, it was quite frustrating to watch. There were two Australia uh, Australian players running back towards the goal line, but neither made a real attempt to stop the ball. It wasn't the best finish. The ball was almost trickling in, and I have to see, if I'm the coach, I want to at least see my defenders make a last-ditch slide tackle effort to try and stop that ball from going in because, you know what, okay, they won by 4-1, but if this is in a more competitive game in a knockout round, if they're facing a far stronger opposition, if you don't make that last-ditch effort to save the ball, you know, that could be the goal that knocks you out of the tournament. Easily. And, and they were really staring at a scenario at that point. So when you go back and look at how the goals were scored, Sam Kerr put Australia up 2-0 at halftime. That goal was in the 49th from Havana Salon. That made it 2-1. And at that stage, up until the final goal, once Brazil scored, and we'll get there in a second because that's <laughs> some controversy as well, at 3-1... Australia was finishing third in the group, and they were the ones who were either going to see France or Germany in the round of 16. And, and Australia coming off of giving up a goal like that and struggling defensively, you would say they were probably heading home after the round of 16. Now, mm -hmm. that final goal they get off a goalkeeping error from Kerr, her fourth of the day, Australia's going into a round of 16 match against Norway which is a very different level of competition than France or Germany. I think Norway and Australia will be a tricky match. I don't think it's an easy one for Australia, but that's it's not the, the same as playing margins France. we're talking about. Yeah, it's not the same as playing the hosts. No, I agree. And this tournament, this group has been ridiculously close to think from the outside before this, uh, before this tournament started, you'd have thought Brazil and Australia were the two to go through and Italy potentially as a third place. But, Italy have come out all guns blazing and like great respect to them because, you know, they were the underdog in this group and they've, they've come out on top and uh, deservedly after watching them play. And I think they're going to feel very hard done by after today's game. Yeah, I think they will in some respects, but also they need the job at hand. And, and it was, you know, you have to, to stay on top and win this group because now Italy goes into a match with either Nigeria or China in the round of 16, completely winnable. And then they're probably going to see either the Netherlands or Canada in that next game. Another one, when you start to look at the contenders in the tournament for Italy, the way they've played, that's another winnable match. And mm -hmm. by avoiding falling into second place, they avoid that side of the bracket where you could see France, you could see the United States, you could see some of the, the teams that, that have been strong in this event. Mm -hmm. And it when you're was... talking about like a team like Italy, 
there's a difference really when you're talking about the US or France whichever side of the bracket you're on doesn't really impact because right. you're expected to make it through to the final but for a team like Italy they need to get on the easier side of the bracket per se because they're not someone that you would expect to be in the final but you know what with an easier route you never know where they end up they can get to a semi I, I think in this tournament and this bracket the way it plays out they can do that um, they did give up a goal here. They did lose today, but they win the group. It's a 74th minute penalty from Marta, which makes her the all-time leading scorer at a World Cup men's or women's. That's massive news. The penalty itself, I didn't love the call. I do like that VAR did not get involved in overturning mm-hmm. it. Uh, I'm I'm glad that didn't happen. You take a look. That's I like fine. that There's a referee clear, made a call on the pitch. I agree. Uh, I, I don't like the call. We, <laughs> No, but at least they made one, you know, and that yes, sounds true. crazy that we're in this stage, but we've seen so much go to VAR lately where it feels like the referees don't feel empowered to make a decision. From my from my thinking, when I watch these games, a lot of the times the referees are thinking, it's better not to make the call because VAR is going to have my back. You know, they're, they're, they're going to VAR instead and potentially not making calls that should be obvious to them. Now, this referee, maybe it was her angle, maybe it was the point of contact she saw. I think it was extremely soft. I agree. Hope Solo on the BBC said that that sort of call doesn't happen in men's football. It only happens in women's football. Uh, The level of contact potentially is less acceptable in the women's game, and that's something that we'd like to see changed because, you know, it is a physical sport. We've got physical players. But... As much as I dislike the call, I agree with you, Jason. The fact that VAR didn't step in was the right thing because it wasn't a clear and obvious error by the referee. There was contact. Uh, it was an odd contact where, you know, the defender's just using her body and we're, we're all encouraged to use our bodies as players. But at least VAR didn't step in in a place. But I think Italy will feel hard done by in that one. Um, but I'm okay with it because... Everyone wanted Martin to get that goal, and I'm hoping now she'll play with sort of less pressure on her shoulders. As much as she's a great and she's got the maturity and you know the mental strength, something like that record probably does lay on your shoulders a little bit. Yeah, she's had a bit of an edge to her in, in this tournament. And, I mean, there was some talk about after, I believe, the last match where she scored to equal close A. Um, some comments to a German reporter after the match who had asked about it and and she was really like focused on on the record as opposed to the match it kind of jumped out to me like okay maybe it's a bit the pressure odd. is getting to her yeah it felt really strange um, but you know what I think it's because she's such a pioneer of the female true. game um something I read which was really cool I didn't realize why she did the cleat celebration but instead mm-hmm. of uh having sponsors for her boots, she chooses to put the, uh, you know, a symbol of gender equality on her cleats. And it must be quite a lot of pressure. Marta really is the most famous female soccer player across the world, I would say. And she's, you know, the best of all time. And that, that does come on your shoulders. But at the same time, you have to be humble in it. And, you know, she needs to be a team player. Brazil have never won. Well, she'll never, she hasn't won a World Cup with Brazil. And, you know, it, it it's something that she needs to realize that it's about the team at the end of the day, first and foremost records on all that. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's just the pressure of it. And I think she knew that she was so close to it. What I'm surprised about now is you get to one nil and 74th minute, you know, that in the other match, you have the situation that has transpired with that fourth goal with the, the Sam Kerr goal that puts Australia back into second place. And if you are Brazil at that stage, and this is the games were maybe a minute apart. So Kerr gets the goal in the 83rd. You're sitting back as Brazil at that stage, which blew my mind because if they had conceded a goal, they would have finished on four points, but they still would have been third place. They still would have, they, they were, they were, definitely going through at four four points and on the group they were going through if you conceded a goal no big deal if you get a goal you're facing norway instead of france or germany and i don't Mm -hmm. know if if the bench or the players knew that It, it felt like they were trying to see the game out and not give up a goal as opposed to going for one that would have changed Mm -hmm. their route in the knockout rounds i was blown away i was absolutely blown away by it I agree completely. And in today's day and age where technology is, you know, everywhere, I I can't see that they didn't know 
the the results and I can't say they didn't know like a live table and for me you take that risk and if you concede a goal and you start panicking that's when you park the bus to defend you've got enough time left to make a difference in score but it's also not long enough really to self-destruct and concede two I, I, I would have thought that a team like Brazil again it's not someone like a USA or a France or an England that you're sort of hey you need to beat everyone anyway it's one of those where you think they would want the easier side of the bracket and an easier draw but alas they didn't do that and it looked like they were just comfortable with the one nil victory and you know what towards the end Italy had that free kick chance and a great save by the goalkeeper from a a cheeky little shot and it could have come back to haunt them because they could have tied 1-1 which is what they didn't want to do anyway how crazy is it that Brazil instead of going for it at this point where they have nothing to lose they're they're already third they weren't going to fall out of that doesn't go for it And Italy, who has nothing to gain by getting a goal because they're going to win the game anyway, Mm -hmm. they're going for it. What in the world? (laughs) But I think for Italy, it's more about they've had such a great performance in the last two games that they they don't want to enter the knockouts with a loss. And like we said so many times, and it's a common phrase in tournaments, it's about getting hot at the right time. And unfortunately for Italy, they didn't have the best performance today. And they'll be disappointed because they had two great performances early on in the World Cup. And now they need to hit that stride again and remember how they were playing early on in the knockouts. Yeah, they're going to have to find that form again. It wasn't a bad performance from them, and it's kind of an odd goal to give up. I, I don't love the call. It happens. I think they'll be okay, and they're going to get a match that is very manageable in the round of 16. So the only mm-hmm. matchup we know for sure right now is Norway-Australia on June 22nd. That one is locked in. The second-place teams in those groups get a chance to play against one another. They'll face likely the winners of Group D, which is England, which leads us to tomorrow. Tomorrow, 3 o'clock, Japan and England, Scotland and Argentina. England's on six points, Japan's on four, Argentina's on one, Scotland is on zero. Everybody's still alive here. Only England and Japan can win the group. A Japan win wins the group. England can win the group with a draw. Argentina goes through with a win over Scotland. Scotland... A needs a win and probably buy a couple of goals. Mm-hmm. To they've kept their goal difference they tight. They, they've done well to keep the goal difference tight throughout the tournament, yes. but at the end of the day, there are only four three, third place spots. So they if they goals. win by one, let me make sure of this before I say it. If they win by one, they would go ahead of Nigeria on the ranking of third place teams. Okay. So actually, if they get a win, they're in pretty good shape. Um, Groups E and F do have opportunities for teams. Two teams that haven't won a match have no points in the group. They play each other in the final day. So it's essentially playoff games. And if margins get kind of weird and Chile and Thailand feels like one that maybe Chile could win by a couple of goals, it could really get interesting. So Argentina-Scotland is essentially a play-in game. Both teams have to play for a win here. That should be a fun match. Yeah, I agree. I think what's exciting at this point is we've talked about this group on numerous occasions. It is a very even group as much as, you know, England and Japan have sort of ran ahead a little bit. All the games have been close. And I'm really interested as much as, you know, I'm an England fan. Part of me wants to, I think I'm going to have to split screen these games because that Argentina-Scotland game is going to be a really, really tough battle. And I think it's one that's going to be one on tactics. And right now, I would say that the Argentinian coach is has shown more tactical prowess than Scotland at the moment. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I wonder if they can flip the script, though, and, and find some of that tactical performance to get more chances in the final third. And they've been built to defend, and they've had to in their first two games. Do they have enough going forward? I think Scotland's a better do. team attack-wise. But... Absolutely. They have so much physical uh, strength up top. They've got some great forwards. They've got fast speed of play. We've seen them mm-hmm. score you know, against England. They showed their quality up top in, in the last 20 minutes. I think what's killed them so far is they haven't put together a 90-minute performance. And they just have had too many gaps between the defenders, the midfielders, and the forwards. And that's, there's not enough midfielders or forwards seeing possession at the moment. If they get the ball to the right people, they can be dangerous. And I think a team like Argentina that's not, you know, as strong will show, will will allow them more opportunities to do what they're good at. I agree. I think Argentina is going to have to 
to kind of keep the same strategy, but look to counter a little more aggressively here. I mean, there's a scenario that Argentina draws and, and they are the third place team with two points and they do get through because if, if uh, Cameroon and New Zealand end up drawing and Chile and Thailand draw, then Argentina would get through. It's, it's very risky, but I don't see Argentina really opening up either. So feels like Scotland's the favorite there. What about England and Japan? What's, what does England have to do here? Is it, you know, maybe sit back a little bit and just ensure that you, you get the result that you need to win the group? Or do you try to build a little bit for the knockout rounds? I want them to play how they intend to play in the knockout rounds. I understand that they want to grind out a result, but I think we've done too much grinding out of results lately and against stronger teams. That's not going to be effective. I want to see them go forward, uh, take chances. But the most important thing is we have to sort of stable up at the back. We've We've given away a couple of dodgy possessions that could have led to goals against better forwards. We gave a, uh, gave away a goal against Scotland. And I'm just hopeful that we can build out the back properly and appropriately and make the right decisions because at the end of the day, everything starts from your defensive line. And as we face stronger oppositions going forward, I don't know how much Japan is really going to challenge the defenders, but they have to take the game seriously and they have to play like they would be playing against a team like France or against a team like the USA because... You never know. You might end up playing them if the draw goes that way. Yeah, a, a very strong possibility of it. And you look at who they would likely see in the quarterfinals. Uh, could be Australia. And we know the firepower that they have. And Norway's the other one. And Norway hasn't been a team that's really sat back a ton either in this tournament. So I'm with you. I think Philip Neville needs to go for this, at least for the first 60 minutes. If, if it's not mm-hmm. on and... and doesn't look likely and you have to kind of see it out to get the point fine but go for it in the first half even up to about 60 70 minutes yeah I agree and that's when you know if you've nailed it by 60 70 minutes then maybe you can take a couple of players off you can rest a few of the girls that have played a lot of minutes but they want to play they don't want to be rested no one wants to be rested honestly most players just want to get minutes under their belt because it's all about those repetitions of play and Neville has been famous for his squad rotation. Uh, wasn't too impressed with the goalkeeper rotation, as we know. But it's one of those things where uh, if we go out and batter them for 60, 70 minutes, give those girls minutes, then you can sort of sub out a few players, give them that rest. But I hope he plays a strong lineup because at the end of the day, that first spot is where you want to end up in the group. Yeah, 100%. It's a much better road for England if they end up winning the group. Uh, Both games tomorrow, 3 o'clock, Japan, England, Scotland, and Argentina. We'll be back tomorrow afterwards to catch you up on how the bracket is looking. We'll see how Jess is doing with her England squad after uh, it could be a little bit of pressure. I mean, Japan's a team that can can win this match, but... They haven't looked too likely of doing that in this tournament. They've been I just hope that I just hope they're focusing on the Olympics tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, they're still <laughs> building for the future. That's what that's what the English fans are hoping for here. We'll see what happens. Uh, we'll be back to catch you up on the bracket and everything else from the Women's World Cup tomorrow evening. Thanks for listening. Make sure you're following us on Twitter at Soccer Down Here at Jessica A T L U T D at Longshoe. We'll talk to you tomorrow.